All right. Uh, well, uh, tonight uh, we're going to give a, a little bit of a, a recap because uh, we've been on uh, this um, study of the power of prayer uh, for about a month. And uh, over the course of this time, we've looked at uh, prayer being the greatest outlet uh, of power uh, that, we, that we have, that we receive from the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's the deciding factor in spiritual uh, warfare. Uh, we looked at how it influences God's actions, uh, but not necessarily His purposes. And last week we looked at how sin um, uh, hinders our prayers. And we looked at quite a few uh, different uh, specifics there uh, about sin, uh, but sin being uh, the main issue when it comes to our prayers being uh, effective. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to look at how to pray. And <clears throat> you say, well, uh, hopefully I've been knowing how to pray uh, way before tonight. And, and I'm not going to submit to you that the way you've been praying is necessarily wrong. Uh, I put in your notes a couple of methods uh, of prayers because over the years there have been several uh, suggestions to uh, a methodology of prayer. I have given you uh, just Corey's methodology of praying before and how I told you that I would start uh, my prayers with sin uh, and, and then I would, uh, my own sin, uh, to repent of that and ask forgiveness and move on. And you may have a way that you normally uh, pray um, when you're in your prayer closet praying for yourself. Uh, a couple of the different examples, uh, the Christian uh, uh, pastor and a commentator uh, from the United Kingdom, Matthew Henry. <coughs> Some of you may have heard of him before. He's got a pretty popular commentary uh, on the Bible that people have used uh, for years. Uh, he has a methodology uh, of prayer, and he actually wrote a book called A Method for Prayer. Uh, and his method goes adoration, confession, petition, thanksgiving, intercession, and then you have a conclusion. So those are kind of like when you're writing a paper and they want to start out with, your, with your, your introduction, you know, your body paragraphs and then your conclusion. You know, those buckets in there. What is adoration? Praise, right? You're adoring him. Uh, confession. Asking forgiveness, confessing your sins. Petition. What you're asking for, I'd like this to happen, I need that to happen. Thanksgiving, that's self-explanatory, right? Giving him thanks. What about intercession? Petitions for other people, right? Uh, and then in your conclusion, I hadn't read the book, uh, uh, but in, in your conclusion you would, uh, I guess, potentially uh, just uh, say amen. Huh? Right there. Yeah, I see what you're saying, Earl. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Pretty good. Um, there, there's another uh, method that is uh, put out there. It's called the Acts uh, method. It's basically, basically a, a shorter version of what Matthew Henry says. It's adore, confess, thank, and then your supplications. Um, <clears throat> then there's also one that's called the Pray method. Uh, this is just acronyms here. Praise, repent, ask, uh, and then yield. Uh, I like that last one here in the pray method to, to yield. And what's that mean? Means that, right? Uh, <laughs> you're, you're, if you know how to read signs and drive, yield is to give way to the other person. You know, right? Uh, so if you're yielding, then you're giving way. You're, you're giving him that right uh, of passage like he needs you to give it to him. But that's just what your attitude would be. And if you look at these, uh, each one of the methods uh, that are proposed here, and these are just a couple, they all start out with some adoration or some praise, right? They all have some element here of repenting, uh, confessing your sins, asking God for something um, uh, or whatever. They're all based um, in one way or another uh, in Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 9 through 13. This is Jesus speaking. We've read this before. We're going to read it again. Uh, this is Jesus speaking here, and he says in the very first part of verse 9, this then is what? How you should pray. And I'm not going to read uh, all through this. We know what the Lord's Prayer uh, says. Um, now, what he's not saying 
And what we have done is we have oversimplified these verses in 9 through 18. And we said, we're going to memorize this prayer and we're going to repeat it over and over as memorized. That's not what he was saying. He was saying, this is your model, okay, for how you should pray. He didn't say, this is what you should pray. Did he? It's not bad on its face, okay? Uh, but it wasn't like you have to walk around, the only prayer you could ever pray is, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, earth is in heaven. And you say that, and then you don't say you know, anything else. Um, <coughs> I put in your notes that, I, that it has, it's the components that might be used in constructing your prayers, okay? Um, and, and so you look at it, and what's he doing there? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be our name. Sounds a lot like adoration and praise, right? Um, and he goes on. Uh, let's, let me just look through this, uh, Joe, at the different uh, components in verse, ni- in verse 9. I mean, uh, excuse me, the last part of this, going to verse 10. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's actually a yielding part, you know, right there uh, in this. In verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. He's asking for something. You know, uh, so you have that component of asking God for sustenance. He's asking for forgiveness uh, for your own sins and then for the ability to be able to forgive other people uh, in verse 12 and verse 13. uh, And he's saying, hey, and, and help me to not be tempted, but deliver us from the evil one here. These are components uh, of, of you and what you should do uh, when, you, when you are praying. Uh, and that's what those other models uh, are talking about uh, as well. Uh, we're going to uh, look at tonight, though, not necessarily uh, a method of prayer. I have no skin in the game on how you construct your prayer. If you want to start it with this, or there is no biblical model that you have to do it this particular way. Let me make sure that you understand that from the beginning. If you want to start your prayer with yielding, and then you want to go to supplication, uh, and then you want to have praise, and you want to end it without a reason, no, there's no reason that you can't do it. Thank you, Mary Beth. Uh, uh, the, you know, how, how you construct your prayer is, is totally up to you. It's up to the circumstances you find yourselves in, what kind of prayer that you're trying to pray, uh, you know, at that particular moment. So again, I'm not seeking today to tell you when you walk out of here, you need to write down, I need to pray this way and say this and say that bucket first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. Come up with that how you, how you want to. I'm going to give you six suggestions on how you should go about your prayer life and about praying. And, and these six suggestions are trying to help you fulfill a mission. And I want to introduce you to this uh, in, in two ways. I think Joe may have, did you go back and put this on the screen? Um, oh, there it is, right in front of my face. Um, but our mission when we are praying, when you set out to pray, should be those two things there. To number one, find what God's purpose is. Your prayer again, remember we've already talked about. Prayers are not you trying to convince God to do something that's outside of his will or something he didn't figure should happen. Your, your prayer is supposed to be lining up with God. So you want to find out what his purpose is. Because what are you not going to do? We talked about this two, two Wednesday nights ago. You're not going to change his purpose. So you need to figure out what his purpose is. And then make that purpose your prayer. If you end it with this, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Aren't you trying to find out what his purpose is? And his plan is? Okay. So... When that, that's the mission, where, that's our end result when we are praying to find out what God's will is and for that will uh, to be made manifest in our lives. So hopefully these six suggestions would help you get to that end result. Number one, and this may seem obvious, but set aside time for prayer. Now if you notice in the bullet points that I have here, this is an unhurried daily time that is dedicated to praying. During this time, it ought to be in such a way that you're never worried about how long it's taking you. Oh my gosh, this is, this is five minutes, this is 10 minutes, 
This is an hour. This is an unhurried, dedicated time that you set aside uh, for God uh, to pray. Um, and, and I say the time we set aside for prayer should be a time when our minds are fresh and our spirits are sensitive to God's voice. So let me just tell you, in my household, the moment that I wake up is not a great time for me to pray. Because, and I'm not saying that I can't set aside a time to get up earlier to do that, because I could, but I'm saying, generally speaking, I'm up late and, and, I, and I sleep a tad earlier than five o'clock like my wife. She gets up, her alarm clock goes off at 4.30 and then she hits it for 30 minutes until she gets up at five. <sighs> but anyway. That's the situation. My ear has been trained to not listen to her alarm clock. Um, so what she'll do is say, time to get up. And, and this was when I was working at the bank because I never had to get up at 5 o'clock to do nothing. Okay. Uh, and, and so time to get up. Well, if I'm up, then all the kids are up. And what we're doing is like when the, um, uh, on, uh, what's that movie? Uh, he left, the, uh, it's a Christmas movie with Macaulay Culkin. Home alone, yeah. You know, when they're trying to get out of the house, go to the airport, because they was like, that's how my house looks every morning, okay, when we're trying to get people to school. Probably not a, it is a hurried time. It's not a good time to be listening to the voice of God. Um, so uh, there, there's other times that you may be able to find. You know, you can say, well, I start my day out with prayer. That's wonderful to do that. You can start your day out with prayer. You should begin your day in somewhere with prayer. Does it have to be? Before you ever put your foot on the ground, it does not have to be. It does not have to be, is what I'm trying to tell you. You can pray in whatever manner in which you'd like to pray, how many times you want to do it. All of those things are left up to you. But I'm saying when you pray, set aside some dedicated time where you can be quiet um, and, and, <clears throat> and, and when you, you can absolutely be sensitive to God's, to God's voice. Um, you really have to be careful not to just look at your schedule right now as your schedule sits here today and say, well, I can fit prayer in maybe here. That, that's, that's, that's probably not what you want to do. Uh, it's not going to work that way. Um, it's going to require a little sacrifice on your part uh, to, if, if you're going to pray correctly. Because just like with your money, if you give correctly, and how the Bible teaches anyway, um, then you ought to give what? To, to God. You, well, you should. But you should give first. You should give first to God not after you looked at your budget and said, well, I think there's this much left and I'll give that. There is no faith in that. There is no sacrifice in that. You already just relegated it to a bill and you've given what you know you can pay, okay? That's why the Bible says uh, in any of the tithes that the Israelites did or anything that people, you know, were doing, you were giving to God and you should give according to your increase and you should do it. Uh, first, that, you know, sure, you can do it the other way if you'd like, you know. Please do. Help us pay the light bill. But when you, that was a joke, good grief. We're not taking up an offering tonight. Um, huh? <laughs> I wouldn't joke. But when it, when, it com when it comes to your prayer time, any, if, if everything you're doing for God is you're going, listen, God, I got this little time for you because I've just slated you out these two minutes over here that I can spare. If you do that with your time and you do that with your, with your money and you do that with your talents and everything else, and he's going, wonderful job. You are really doing a whole lot for me. Great. I'm going to bless your socks off. You, ever, you know when somebody else does you that way, when you know for a fact all they're giving you is what's left over? Doesn't make you feel real good, does it? And it doesn't make God feel real good either. But if you'll set aside some time where, uh, where you say, this is my dedicated time for prayer, that's going to be uh, your best, uh, best thing to do. The second thing is a suitable place. 
Now, again, uh, you can pray anywhere, can't you? You can pray going down the road. You know, I've always been taught all my life to close my eyes and bow my head when I pray. I wouldn't recommend it driving. <laughs> but I tell you, when I would do that, I, used to, and I still do, uh, uh, if I'm in the car, especially if it's in the morning or something, and they're praying, and I used to do this, you know. You know, it just kind of felt bad looking straight and, and, and praying, you know, I just always, you know, at least got your head bowed or something. So I would close one eye, uh, but I keep both eyes open uh, now if I do it, I think it's safer. Um, but, and I realize that, you know, you really didn't have to quite do that. But why do we close our eyes? Why is that a, even a practice? Okay. Hmm. I think that's the main reason why we do that. We're focusing on him. And if your eyes are open, you're focusing on everything that you're seeing. You're focusing on what somebody else is doing. You're focusing on that other person that don't have their eyes closed. You know, and look what they're doing over there. That person's talking. That person's doing this. Like, oh, look over there. I see a car going down the road. You know, you're looking at all that stuff when you... When you have your eyes closed, you're focusing on God. And so notice what uh, I, I said uh, here in your notes, that when we're serious about strengthening our prayer life, we must find that quiet place where we can be shut in with God. Okay. Uh, remember, as we've already read, we'll read it again, Matthew 6, 6. says, but when you pray, go into your room. What? Close the door. And pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who, who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Um, <clears throat> so it says there in verse 6 that we should close the door. Two purposes for, closing, for having doors and closing them. You shut things out and you shut things in. Right? When you go home and you go into your house tonight, you're going to shut your door. And there's two reasons for that. You're making sure somebody can't come in, and if you got little kids and maybe you have animals or pets or something, you're making sure they're not just being able to, uh, to go out. Same purpose when it comes to you going into this quiet place and this quiet time for God for prayer. You need to shut things out in the world. Shut things out that are happening in your house. Shut things out that have happened in your day today. All right, and you need, and it needs to be quiet, and you need to shut yourself in with God the Father and with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, and so, yes, you can be in the middle of Times Square, and you can be praying. Yes, you can be driving in your car. Yes, you can pray when you're at work. Yes, you can pray wherever that you are, but do you? Usually not. You say, well, I can pray anywhere, but you don't. But I don't. We don't pray unless we set aside the time, unless we focus on that time. You go about your day and you get to the end and you go, man, I never prayed because this squirrel was happening. That squirrel come up over there. That was going on. I was looking over there. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to get to this next task. And you do everything else but commune with God. Okay. So yes, you can, but we know you probably already don't. So the suggestion is pick a time, pick that place and do it, okay? Um, and the last bullet point that I put here, this is important for what we're about to talk about. Our quiet place and the time we set aside, they're necessary for you to train your ears for hearing, okay? Because as we'll look at the next thing, you know, you need to use your Bible when you pray. Now, you may think that I mean pray in the Scriptures, so you pray things like, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Or I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You know, or, uh, you know, he who began a good work in me will see it to completion. Or, you know, you, or whatever else that you quote scripture as you, as you pray. Not decrying that. You absolutely may do that uh, in your prayer. That's not what I'm talking about, though, uh, in using your Bible. We've discussed this already in this study, that prayer is not, and I repeat, it is not just you talking. It's not just you talking to God and you having a one-way uh, conversation. It's also you listening. 
And not just listening whenever you've asked. You've done all this talking, and then you shut up, and then you start listening. Listening is also in the beginning. If you're going to look at that mission, you're going to know what the purpose and the will of God is. You're probably going to have need to be listening in communion with him before. Or how else would you know it? Okay? How would you know what his will is so you can then pray uh, what, what his will is? So requ prayer requires three organs in your head. I got them in the notes. What are they? Your ears, your tongue, your eyes. Your ears so you can hear God, your tongue so you can speak, and your eyes so you can watch him move. Okay? Um, and so it's not just your mouth when you're praying. Um, if you take a look at the Bible, we call it all the time and refer to it as what? I've, I've got it in the notes. What? Why do we say that? It literally is his word. The Bible is literally God speaking to us, right? I mean, it, 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 is his, it is a recorded transcript of God speaking to people so that we can have it and we can read it. We can listen to it in uh, uh, an audio uh, format. You can hear somebody teach on it. You can go back and read it again. It is literally God's word, not just us uh, saying that, but it's absolutely him speaking to us. So if you want to hear God, and, and we're talking about right now in Sunday school, hearing the voice of God, if you want to ha be able to listen to God, you better be somebody that studies his word and knows what his word uh, is saying. Uh, <clears throat> the, the Bible is that wonderful tool for our eyes to read, but it's an even better tool, I say, for your inner ear. And I don't mean that part where you get those inner ear infections. You know, I'm talking about that inner part of your soul. I have, I tell people this all the time, told somebody uh, up here uh, the other Sunday, this stool is a little bit odd. It's four legs. I'm going to talk to you about the three-legged stool. Number one, if you are going to be a participating Christian and you're going to have a, a walk uh, with the Lord, there are three things that you ought to do. You should pray. You should read and study your Bible. And you should attend a church. Now, that's not an exhaustive list, but I can tell you, if you'll do those three things, pray, read your Bible, and fellowship and congregate with other believers, you will be very, very close to being well on your way uh, to doing things. But try it. Try doing the other two with cutting out any one. You say, I can pray and read my Bible at my house. Can you? Sure. Will it affect your Christian walk? Sure. Will it affect it negatively? Probably. Why? <laughs> you don't get a chance to practice on each other. Philip said, boy, that was, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. What's the benefit of being in church? And, and it didn't say you got to be in a Bible study with a teacher. It said that you, it said, do not forsake the assembly of yourselves together. What is the value in assembling together? You, uh, I'm not going to point anybody. I'm not going to point anybody out. But there are plenty of people in this room that you have had some experience in your life uh, to where you were going through something, uh, and and you went to a meeting, or you're required to go to meetings where there are people. Why do we do such things? Huh? support, encouragement, learning from one another. When you go to those meetings and things of that nature, you know, whatever those meetings are, there could be plenty of them. In your work, they call meetings where you congregate together and you do different things. You go there um, and you hope that other people may share something and you can learn from those other people and things of that nature as well. So that's the important, if you try to pray and just read your Bible and you never go to church, I'm telling you, it's going to be a wobbly stool. You say, well, I've been going to church and I've been reading my Bible, but I had not been praying. Same difference. It's a wobbly stool. You can say, well, you know, and I can keep going on the different iterations of what you, which one that you can cut out, but you can spend all your time reading and all your time praying, all your time going to church and you're never reading your Bible. That's going to be a problem. 
okay? Reading your Bible uh, is extremely uh, important for us when it comes to our prayer life. Um, and so how, what, what, does, what does that look like? If you are praying for something, I would encourage you to do this. You pray and you say, well, I'm listening. I would be reading my Bible and, and studying the Bible and searching God's word for what I even uh, intend to pray for. Okay? Before you start praying, how about reading his already written word and seeing if he's got an answer that just jumps right on out at you. Then, as you are praying, then you will continue to read his word. And guess what? There will be plenty of times that the answer then jumps right out and slaps you in the face. You know? And it may be a confirmation. You may not have seen it even before. But I'm telling you, you will find a tremendous amount of answers. Not with him sending you a text, but right here. I would submit to you every one of your answers. Right in his spoken word already. So, there you go on, on that one. Uh, the, the fourth one we've talked about, uh, being, and I didn't say just praying in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit uh, when, when you're praying. Um, we looked at before that the Spirit uh, is a master intercessor. I mean, he knows what, what, what we should uh, be praying, even when we can't pray uh, ourselves. Uh, and he's interceding for us all the time. Um, and, and so it would behoove us if we'd let the Spirit lead us and let the Spirit teach you uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to prayer. How you pray, what you pray for, when you pray, where you pray, and why you're even praying. You know, it, you say, well, I, I know why I'm praying. Do you? You know, if we're re really being led by the Holy Spirit, then he ought, and if he knows how to pray better than we do, right? Because he knows how to pray when you don't even know how to do it. Well, why don't we let him take the lead? Look at um, the quote that I've given you in your notes. And uh, Martin Luther is quoted as saying this. He's referring in the first part of this quote uh, to what Psalm 37, 7 says. But it says, Rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. And he says in Hebrew, be silent in God and let him mold thee. Keep still and he will mold thee to the right shape. Okay? So when you're think, thinking about God, you're thinking about the Holy Spirit, you're being led by the Holy Spirit, it's not you, when you're praying in the Spirit, it's not you saying, Holy Spirit, I'm trying to convince you to get on my side so you can then go and convince God because you're my intercessor and all that. No, you're letting the Holy Spirit mold you so that you are in the right shape. Okay, and if he's molding you in that way, then your prayers are going to be molded uh, in that way. When, when you surrender to the Holy Spirit's leading, um, then you should find yourself then praying in the Spirit. Okay, so I just, I, I, I want to caution you sometimes. When you really have something major that you're trying to pray for, who's the first person that you go to for advice? You don't have to answer this. I'm asking you. To think about it. Do you pick up the phone and say, hey, I need to call a pastor, you know? Or I need to call my best friend and say, hey, really, what should I do about this? The first person that you ought to go to is God, okay? Amen. The first person, and, I, and I'm, you say, well, that's, that's praying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rather than blabbing your jaw to somebody else, I mean, you ought to be doing it to somebody who knows what they're talking about and who ultimately you're going to be getting around to in a little bit to be able to talk uh, to them, but communing with him, okay? Uh, this is where we go back to that communal uh, type prayer. If you're not spending this time communing with God and just having fellowship with him and, and, and surrendering to him and all of these decisions and learning about God, having this deep relationship with him, prayer is an extremely relational action that we do, okay? That you have this relationship with God and, and, and when that relationship is really tight, then you're finding your prayers to be a lot more effective, than if you're just going up and asking a random stranger to help you do something, okay? Um, so absolutely being led by the Holy Spirit. Then we're looking at praying in Jesus' name, okay? Uh, we do this 
almost every time somebody prays uh, uh, here, in, here in church, and probably you do it yourself, you, you end your prayers within Jesus' name. But look how I, I put this in your notes here. Uh, it, it, it's true that the Holy Spirit is our inlet of power, right? We talked about that prayer is our greatest outlet of power, and the Holy Spirit's the one who's given us uh, this power. But why do we have access to that power? You just don't get the power because you're here, right? Does, d- let me ask you a question. Does every human being on the planet right now possess the power that we've been talking about? They can't. <laughs> I'm sorry. Does every person on the planet right now, every human being, have the power that we have right now yes. talking about prayer? Yes. Well, you all said no, and then some people are changing their answers now because I made a face. I <laughs> No, what I'm saying is what I said. <laughs> what I'm saying is what I said. Um, well, hold on. <laughs> what did you say, Jenna? I'm sorry. Oh, well, now I think they have the potential power, but unless you have the Holy Spirit, then you don't have the power we've been talking about. You have the power only in one sense. God, I need you, and I want to be saved. Okay? That, now, this is the way Corey believes about it. Because anybody can talk to God, okay? And this is, this is what I'm trying to get you to understand. Prayer is not just you talking to God. Anybody can talk to God, and that's why I ask you the question that way. Yes, they have the ability to talk to God, but they don't have the power in prayer that we're talking about, that the, the power of prayer is a series. In, God hears the utterances of every human being on this planet, okay? But is just an utterance out of your mouth a powerful and effective prayer? No. It is just a communication to God. So I'm trying to get you to understand we possess much more than when I talked about this in the very first session, much more than just the ability to utter things to God. Our prayers, when we pray for somebody overseas in another country, you're praying for people in Ukraine, there is power like running through a power line over there where things are changing and things are active and and God is moving. Okay, a unsaved person does not have access to that power line except in one way from themselves to God about salvation. That's my view in that. Okay, so when you look at praying in Jesus' name, we have access to this power because we are something you raise your hand. I'm sorry, and I miss you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't have power. No, he he heard you fill up praying a petition prayer for yourself, but he he was going to answer that by saying, "When you surrender yourself to me and you're born again, I'll take care of you." That's the, that's how I figure he's answering the prayer. Now I'm not God, okay? But now when you're praying and you're unsaved and you're praying for your grandma who's on life support, does he hear what you're praying? Yeah. Sure, sure. Is there any power behind what you're praying? Not necessarily, okay? Not necessarily. Um, and, and, and you're just trying to talk to God. You know, he's hearing you, and he could choose to do what he wants to do, but you lack the power uh, that, that, that is out there uh, uh, for, for other people. Yes, sir. That's right. And he, oh yeah, that's what I'm saying. He, hear, he, he hears that prayer. He's going to answer that prayer you know, for, for you, because that's where I'm saying you do have, there is power in that prayer that you have in, in the prayer for salvation, okay? Um, so we, we understand that we get this power and this access, I should say, to this power 
through Jesus Christ, substitutionary atoning sacrifice on the cross and his subsequent resurrection from the dead, right? He died in our place. He paid uh, for our sin debt, and we uh, have grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So that's the reason, that's the kind of citizenship card that you need to have access to that kind of power. So I want you to ask yourself, though, and I, I kind of put this uh, in a little bit of a different way. Suppose the Supreme Court is hearing a case, all right? And what, it doesn't matter what the case is about, uh, but the Supreme Court, they're hearing arguments uh, for a case, and in walks this Iranian lawyer, okay, citizen of Iran, somebody who has never passed the American Bar Association test, they're not licensed to practice law in the entire United States, they're licensed to practice in Iran, right, um, and, and they're, again, they're not able to practice law anywhere in the United States of America. Would that Iranian lawyer have the authority to address our Supreme Court as an attorney on a matter of law. They, 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 you and I just can't walk up to the Supreme Court and stand, in, now you can submit, now technically, if I was going to get technical with you, you can submit what's called an amicus brief, which is called a friend of the court brief, and you can write something, but you can't stand there behind that lectern and say, Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court, and you start arguing a case in front of them. You have to be licensed by the American Bar Association to practice law, and you have to be able to have, not just that, you have to have some standing before that court. For the, the, you can't just walk in there tomorrow and say, I want to talk to you about my property taxes. You know, they're like, this is not, this is not the time or place. Um, and it's the wrong court for that. Go to the county. Um, and, and, and so th I say this is a lot like the situation that we find ourselves in before God the Father when we're trying to commune with him. We have power through the Holy Spirit, but we must remember that that power is available because of Jesus Christ. And so when I'm talking about you praying in Jesus' name, God, when you're praying and you're arguing your case, God is not looking that your name is on the name plate. He's looking are you in Jesus' name? Okay? Do you have that authority in Jesus' name? Or he's going, I'm not sure you have standing to address me in this matter. Okay? So it's so much more than you just saying, in Jesus' name at the end of your prayer. Okay? Is that you are in his name. Now, what does that look like? We've already read it. John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Jesus says, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Again, he's not saying, at the end of your prayer, say, in Jesus' name. And you're going, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm following what he said in John 14, 13, and 14. No. Are you in him? What's that look like? Let's look at what 1 John uh, tells us in 1 John 5, 13, and 15. It says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, which is Jesus, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. When you ask in the name of the Son of God. You see what I'm saying? Okay. This scripture, these scriptures are what it means to be in the name of Jesus and to pray in the name of Jesus. Um, I, I put in your notes that we must be included with Christ, okay? To be included with Christ. It's not words that you say. It is your position with Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 uh, and verse 13, it says, And you also were included in Christ when? You heard the message of truth the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. When you're praying, 
and you're standing there making your petitions before God, he's looking at you to see if that seal is upon you, okay? Not a seal on a degree from the Harvard Law School, but the seal of the Holy Spirit, which is that deposit guaranteeing your inheritance, which goes back to Jesus Christ. That's what it means. And so the, 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 the basic point is you got to be born again if you're going to pray in Jesus' name. If you're not born again, if you're not saved, if you're not a Christian, you are not praying in Jesus' name. An unsaved person is not going to be praying in Jesus' name. When it comes to all these other things I'm talking about, their salvation, if they want to believe, they want to offer their, their repentance to God, yes, uh, obviously he's going to do that. But I, you, know, you hear somebody, this is why folks, why I say some people, they just don't want just everybody up praying for them. If you've got 50 people up here praying for you and they are not praying in Jesus' name, being led by the Holy Spirit, they don't believe anything they're, they're praying, it may not hurt anything, but it sure ain't going to help, is it? What good, what good is it that 50 unsaved people are praying for you? All you need is just yourself that is in righteous standing. Now, I want to make myself clear. Not just unsaved people, but you can be a saved person and not necessarily be praying in Jesus' name. You may have things going on in your life, whether that's unrepentant sin. Uh, maybe it's, it's just all kinds of heavy burdens and things, that, stumbling blocks in your life that you've allowed to, to break your communion with God uh, as far as you know, how your relationship is in that moment. And you may be down there trying to pray, and you may not be able to be praying in Jesus' So I'm not saying that that's necessarily just simply tied to salvation, but that, I'm saying for a saved person, I, we're going to refer to that more in looking at how your communion is uh, with God, how close you are, how righteous you come to him, and all of that. Those things do matter. We talked about um, the faithful, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much uh, already. So the last point that I'll make to you tonight is, is that you should pray in faith. Now, we talked a little bit about faith a couple of weeks ago, and I took that chair. Uh, none of y'all, I noticed as you sat down tonight, um, and I said this in Sunday school, nobody sat down on those pews and went, well, let me see. Let me see. You just plop right on down and just hope that the wood was going to hold up, didn't you? There's one up here that was broke, and I didn't test it either. And when I sat down, I thought, whoa, I should have tested this thing before uh, I sat down uh, on that. When, when I'm saying pray in faith, I'm not saying that you need to uh, understand that God can do something. That don't take a lot of faith. We know God can do anything. But when you're praying in faith, you're praying that God will do it. And now you go, well, that's, boy, Corey, that's getting real that's getting real out there. You mean to tell me that you're saying that I need to pray and I need to have faith that that's going to happen. If you have gone through what I'm talking about tonight and you have gone through what I've said, that you set aside a time, you set aside the place, that you're using your Bible, you're being led by the Spirit, you're praying in Jesus' name, then you're doing you should be doing right. What John 14 was saying, Jesus' own words, you're probably going to be asking him for something that's in his name. And what did he say? Let's look at it again. He says, if, right? Joe's got it. John, four, uh, John 14, verse 13. And go, go to verse 14 for me. That's where I need to be. You may ask anything in my name and I will do it. Verse 15, uh, excuse me. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right, you're right, you're right. Uh, so, the, the, th the thing, ooh, I'm just looking. Yeah, he says, he says right here, uh, you may ask anything in my name and I will do it. Okay, look at uh, 1 John verse 15. For, excuse me, 1 John 5, which you had up there, Joe, uh, and then verse 15. What's the last part say? Whatever we ask. Whatever we ask, we know. See that? No. You know that what we have, well, excuse me, that we have what we ask for. That what you've asked for is going to happen. How do you have that? Look at, uh, back at verse 14 uh, for me. Uh, maybe it was 13. So, no, it's verse 14. 
This is the confidence. This is the way that you can have this kind of faith if you know that you have prayed in the manner in which the Bible instructs us to pray, that not only can he do it, but he will do it. Um, and so I'd say that faithless prayers, it was hard for me to write this bullet point. And what I've wrote is faithless prayers are nothing more than mere words. But thankfully, the Spirit intercedes on our behalf at times, right? Because there are, I, I wanted to say that faithless prayers mean nothing. Well, I, I, I couldn't quite go that far that faithless prayers mean nothing. They are just mere words. They probably lack any power. But as a Christian, you have that Holy Spirit that you didn't know how you were praying or maybe you were just praying incorrectly. And we have the Holy Spirit that may be autocorrect. And as I said before, he may go behind this and say, well, God, that's what he said. But he meant to say this. And he's so gracious in doing that kind of stuff. I mean, it's crazy. So many times you prayed specifically and you were limiting something and he goes, Lord, don't listen to that. That, that. that was really dumb. Do this. How many times have, have you been thankful that God did not do exactly what you told him to do? Woo! Woo, I would miss out on a lot of blessings because I told him, you know, it's just like those, those workers that went and they were working that day uh, in, the, in the parable. The, 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 the owner goes out and he's, he gets his, his first shift and he tells the people, right, that I'm going to, you're going to, you know, go work for uh, Daenerys. And they go and they, they go to work, right? The, 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 the second uh, group of people, I may be telling this wrong, I think he may have, anyway. I think I'm saying it right. But the second group of people, uh, he goes and he, and he, he asked them and, and they go and they work for Daenerys III, you know, on down to the point that I'm trying to make. But when it goes to the time for prayer, I mean the time for pay, prayer, paying them, you know, the, the, he pays everybody the same. The second, third, fourth shift, people are mad because they paid them all the same. And they, the first group, I should have said that incorrectly, the first group was mad because he paid all the others that didn't work as much. But the first group was the only people that he said, I'll pay you a Daenerys. And they said, yes, we'll go work. The second group, the third group, the fourth group, he just said, I'll pay you what's right. And they, he never made a contract. And what I, God hit me one time in reading that, and I don't know if this is exactly the way that you ought to look at it, but this is what, one of the things he gave me about that is, there are times... When you bargain with God and you tell him, I, you mentioned something a while ago, I'll do this, God, if you do this. That first group, you know, they said, well, we'll work for, what will what, what you come work for? I'll work for Daenerys. Okay. You know, he may have given them two if they had just said, nevertheless, not what your will is, you know. Uh, on there. So sometimes it's good for specific prayer. It's good for you to ask God specifically for things, but just be careful that you are yielding to him in your prayer, and you're not saying, God, I know exactly what I need, because sometimes he may just give you that when he has something else in store, and I don't want to miss out on any blessings, you know, just because I only asked for this much, but he had this much, you know, out here for me. You don't, you don't know. So pray in faith, and when you're praying, and you're praying how we've discussed tonight, then you would have been praying in the Holy Spirit, you've been praying in Jesus' name, and you're going to be asking for things that are according to his purpose. And then if you've made that your prayer, I guarantee you, it will happen. It may not happen exactly like your head imagined it to happen, but it will happen, okay? And it will happen according to to his will, which is what we're looking for in the first place. So I just make a disclaimer at the end uh, that there is no science about how you should pray. Don't let anybody teach you that you have to pray any particular way, in any particular words, at any particular set amount of times. That is not the point because God is not procedural in that way. If you do it, just if you, if the only thing you do is sit there and repeat the Lord's Prayer every morning, or if you sit there at your table and you pray this, I think about blessings sometimes with my kids and they say, you know, bless the food, bless the meat, good God, let's eat. No, not that one. 
Uh, but they, they say, you know, uh, what, what's the little, um, God is good, God is great, let us thank him for this food. Bow our heads, we now be fed. Thank you, Lord, for our daily bread. What is the value in repeating the same exact thing over and over and over? It's words, but you get to a point you do not mean it anymore. You're not thinking about what you're saying. You're just repeating a line, okay? Um, and so if, you, if you've been praying the Lord's Prayer, and you go, I'm just repeating it. If your heart has not been in tune with what you're praying, then it's, it doesn't matter. It, I mean, it, 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 he hears you, but it's not a lot of power in that, is what I'm saying. So don't let somebody put you in a box. Commune with God, number one. I mean, as we've been saying throughout this whole time. Next week, we're going to take a look at how Jesus went about prayer, some of his practices and prayer. Take a look at the Bible. Look at the times. He has given us a tremendous amount of material to see how he prayed and what he did. And he, he was talking to himself. So what was the point in the prayers? So we would know how we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to commune. You can learn a lot from how how he prayed. Uh, so think about that, uh, look at it. And again, tonight was not so that you can look at these bullet points and say, well, I'm gonna go down that order. It's not an exhaustive list. It's just a framework for you to think about that. And I encourage you that if not today, tomorrow, that you do, one of, you do those two things. Pick a time and it can just be five minutes. Seriously, you don't have to spend 30 or three hours like Martin Luther. It could just be five minutes, but pick a time, unhindered, uninterrupted. Pick that quiet place, spend some time in prayer and give that to God and see how things uh, go and are more powerful um, in, 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 <clears throat> in your life. Uh, but don't, don't wait, uh, do it now. We've got a lot of things and a lot of people uh, that, that need prayer, and uh, there's, there's a, uh, quite a bit uh, of those things I know that are going on uh, in your life, and the more we can commune with the Father, the more we can pray to Him, I can tell you, uh, the more things we're going to be able to see uh, change, okay? Uh, Philip, will you close us in prayer, sir? Amen. Amen.